Hollywood has for a long time hidden behind this, the safety of this like veil of fictionalization while at the same time being able to exploit real people's stories and point to those real people's stories in order to sell their product. But they didn't bother to even reach out to me to talk about the Amanda Knox character in their film. And I think that was because a lot of people think of me not really as a human being, but as an idea of a person, as like a tabloid entity that they can sort of constantly refer back to without actually engaging with as a real human being. How do you deal with that? Because you are obviously a real person. I have found it to be incredibly, incredibly difficult to be a definitive voice in my own life because I sort of started at a disadvantage. I was four years in prison with tons of people writing and authoring my experience and saying who I was as a human being. So I came into the free world without really having a grasp over my own identity and over my own uh, over my own reality even like the fact that like i was convicted for a crime that i didn't commit truly 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 imprinted upon me the fact that sometimes the truth doesn't matter sometimes the story is the thing that matters and what people really grasp onto and the consequences real human lives are lost in the process but this is your life and it's been 14 years since meredith was murdered 10 years since you were cleared of the crime. You're now 34, married, recently had a baby, but in some ways you're still stuck back in 2007. And it's like you're not allowed to move on, not just by Hollywood, but by associations that people hold with your name. Yes. It's the biggest challenge of my life um, because it, it's still this sort of perpetually trying to prove my innocence and also trying to prove that I'm not the human being that people have constantly taken me for. And I've, I've struggled with this. I've struggled with whether or not this is a winning battle, like if there is a way to win. I still don't know to this day if I'm ever going to do anything in my own life, my, myself, that's going to define me as much as the accusation of something that I didn't do. People will recognize you. You haven't changed the way you look. You could have done all sorts of things that you've chosen not to do. It's kind of the same reason why I never, conf like I never, you know, pled guilty to a crime that I didn't commit. I didn't do it and it's not fair. And so I'm sort of, I'm a little bit stubborn in the sense of like, there's nothing wrong with my name and there's nothing wrong with my face. And what happened is not my fault. So I'm not going to be the one to willingly bear the costs of this, misinformation campaign. I just wanted to find out if you still ever try and convince people. So I don't engage with it because I feel like it's a losing battle. If you've, if you've consumed a tabloid story about me and you want to engage with me on a tabloid level, there's, there's no conversation to be had. I found that that is one in which someone has already made up their mind about me. And no matter what I do, it's always going to be seen through a guilty lens. I'm still someone who has been deeply traumatized by this experience. I think that um, my relationship obviously with um, the Italian media and the British media has is frustrating. Their job was to hold the authorities accountable to the truth. And instead of holding the authorities accountable to the truth and to the evidence, they latched on to any and all salacious misinformation to, to sell a product to people instead of sharing real information that was in the public interest. I could have stopped talking about this long ago if the people who were responsible for how this entire case spiraled out of control were accountable to the truth. It's also journalists' duty to cover what they can get their hands on. And also here we had a British girl, a British woman who was murdered, and you were put in the frame, as was your then boyfriend. And that in itself, regardless of how, I suppose, tabloids function and media operations, was a story so many people wanted anything they could get their hands on. If we just want a story so bad because it has all these elements that make it just, you know, like perfectly salacious that we just can't like help ourselves to get like, to treat it like, you know, guilty candy. Like this is at the expense of Meredith's family and my family and Raffaele's family and the people who are most directly traumatized by the experience. One of the things that has uh, bothered you the most, it seems, about those trials and the way it was covered was the misdirected focus on your sexuality. 
And you say you keep yeah. talking about this because you don't think it has changed. Yeah. So if we think about the way that this case ultimately was portrayed, it was never about the men, <laughs> the, like there were there were two men who were accused in this case and they became irrelevant very quickly, despite the fact that one of them had an insane amount of evidence against him of having sexually assaulted and violently murdered Meredith. He disappeared. What happened was it became a morality tale about female sexuality. Meredith was pitched as this puritanical, virginous Madonna character, and I was portrayed as this sexually like obsessed, like lustful, uninhibited whore. And ultimately, the reason why people like so latched onto this case was because they were having like they were judging female sexuality through us. They were they were making sort of Meredith into this perfectly invisible ideal victim to never name again. And I, I it's fascinating to me the number of times that Foxy Noxy was in the headline, but Meredith's name was not. I, like idea of a sexually deviant, like violent woman was enough to get people so riled up that they didn't care about the truth anymore. And that is an insane problem. And that is something that I don't think has really, really been addressed. How like justice was thwarted because of our obsession with, with female deviancy and female sexuality. If a case like this happened today, 14 years on, do you think it would be any different? Has it got any better? I would hope that people would uh, be more skeptical about that portrayal of events today. That said, I do think that social media was already quite active at the time of my case and had a huge impact in, um, in how the case played out. And if anything, it has become even more about tribalism, which is also a big problem that happened in my case where like people vehemently stood for one side or the other and were unable, again, there was that sense of confirmation bias. You see what you want to see. I know that you, you've talked also about what was often called for so long, the Lewinsky scandal, the Lewinsky affair, and your point about how you frame things. Why is it not called the Clinton scandal, the Clinton affair? But have you met Monica Lewinsky? Have you talked about trying to own your own name? I have met her. Um, and she has given me a lot of like thoughtful advice about processing this human experience, especially the experience of people not allowing you to be who you are. You are you are the idea of them and you stand in as a kind of a cultural scapegoat for their ideas about women. One thing that has given me sort of hope is that is how she has been going out now to speak about her her story and to speak about it from her perspective. But at the same time, she's still in conversation with that scandalous period of her life. And it's like before she's allowed to exist and do anything else, she has to engage with that story, which is another way of sort of removing her agency. You've said throughout this conversation that your name has been disproportionately focused on. Um, but for instance, that Netflix documentary that you took part in was called Amanda Knox, for example. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm not saying, yeah. I mean, you can tell me if you had any say over the name of it, not for instance, the murder of Meredith Kircher. So um, I can say that I didn't have any editorial control. I was not a producer on that film. I was just interviewed like everyone else. And I, so I, you know, didn't have a say over whether or not it was named Amanda Knox. I think the thing that the filmmakers very intelligently did in that film is they pointed out how the case came to be about me in this very strange way. The question also that came up at the time from Meredith's sister, Stephanie, who made a statement on behalf of the family, she wondered why you were still choosing to relive this nightmare. And some people watching this interview may also wonder why. Well, I think in part because I don't think the truth has honestly ever been acknowledged. I know that the um, for me, there's a sense of there not being closure in this case. And I think that I'm trying to point out the fact that the reason why there is a, a sense of not closure is because the truth was never the most important thing in this case. I am very aware this week is um, the anniversary, 14 years since Meredith Kircher was murdered. 
how do you think of her? I don't know if you do anything to mark it or, or what, what do you think about when you think of Meredith? Oh my, um, I mean, this year, um, it's funny, all of the years leading up to this, I have always, when I, whenever I've thought about this day and this, this day of like remembrance, I've always put myself in Meredith's shoes. How, and even just the fact that if I had been there that night, I could have been murdered as well. And I like, I'm sort of haunted by this like survivor's guilt kind of thing where like, if maybe if I had been there, we would have been able to fight him off together, or maybe we'd both be dead. I don't know if it had been me and, she, and, and I had died and then she was wrongly accused. Like those, those sort of thoughts go through my mind. And I keep thinking, wow, like a horrible thing happened to me that usually happens to men, usually happens to disenfranchised men. I'm a young woman. I don't, young women don't often get wrongly accused. It's more often that someone, a young woman is going to be raped and murdered. And so I think about that and how countless women before her have suffered that fate. But this year, this year, um, I've been thinking about Meredith's mom. It's the, it's the first year that I've put myself in Meredith's mom's shoes. And I am um, thinking about that for my own daughter, um, how I, I want the world to be a better place for her than it was for me and that it was for Meredith. Thank you very much, Amanda Knox. The Kircher family gave us this message. There's not a day that goes by where Meredith isn't in our thoughts. And after all these years, her loss and the manner of it still cuts deeply and always will. It's something we will never truly get over. We should also say that we approached Focus Features and Netflix for comments on their films that we discussed in that interview, but we haven't heard back from those companies.